The African gorilla, the Bengal tiger, the African lion. These are all animals that are pervasive to our culture, present in our storybooks, on our nursery walls, but also as symbols, whether it be for courage, ferocity, or bravery. Traits that we value and attempt to reflect in our daily lives. It shouldn't come as a surprise that many of our sports teams attempt to emulate these ideals by using these majestic animals as mascots. But that isn't the only thing these animals have in common. These animals are endangered. We've all heard of the term endangered, or perhaps even threatened. But what does it all really mean? Who decides which animals are in trouble? What does it take to be designated as protected? And perhaps most importantly, how can you help? Conservation biology is a relatively new science, but one of the most important of our time. It is a discipline focused on the anticipation, prevention, and repair of ecological damage to protect biodiversity of the world. While the conservation of nature has always existed as some type of movement throughout much of modern human history, it did not emerge as a science until 1950, when an ecologist and writer, Paul Sears, chaired the first graduate program in conservation science in the United States. At around the same time, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, was founded by the Swiss League for the Protection of Nature as the world's first government-organized, non-governmental organization. The IUCN is made up of 1,300 member organizations and 16,000 experts with six primary commissions, each focused on a specific task, species survival, environmental law, protected areas, social and economic policy, education and communication, and ecosystem management. Most importantly, the IUCN World Conservation Congress meets every four years to discuss policies and programs, among of which is the Red List. Founded in 1964, the Red List of Threatened Species was meant to become the comprehensive inventory of conservation status of the species of the world. In order for a species to be added onto the Red List, it must be investigated by the IUCN Survival Commission, which works in tandem with other member organizations of the IUCN. This investigation is then checked for accuracy by Red List authorities, which are organizations in charge of reviewing each new addition to the list. In common vernacular, most people refer to species at risk such as the giant panda as endangered. However, there are actually multiple levels of relative danger to a species conservation level according to the IUCN's Red List. The Red List consists of nine categories, not evaluated, data deficient, least concern, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, and extinct. These categories are grouped into three main sections, extinct, threatened, and lower risk. Extinction refers to species in which there are no known members alive overall or no known members in the wild. These include animals such as the passenger pigeon as well as the woolly mammoth. The next main section, threatened, refers to animals that are at risk of endangerment in the near future or are already endangered, such as the African elephant or the blue whale. The last main section, lower risk, refers to animals whose populations are so high and sustainable that there is no threat of endangerment. Animals that are representatives of this section include humans and a common gray squirrel. How a species might fit in these categories is determined by five criteria. Only one criteria needs to be fulfilled to put a species in a particular category. The first is reach reductions in its population. If a relatively large population has a strong downwards trend, it can qualify for the list. A species can also qualify if its population size is below a certain threshold. The third criterion combines both trend and population size. If a species has both a moderately low population size and a moderate downwards trend, the species can still qualify, even if its population is not small enough or decreasing enough to meet the first two criteria. Geographic range is also a factor. The size that a species occupies and the distribution of those areas matter. Species with fewer total areas and more fragmentations are placed in higher risk categories. Lastly, a high probability of extinction in the wild puts species in higher risk categories as well. So what are ways that you can help conserve the creatures of the world? There are many ways to do so, and you don't need a degree in order to do something. For example, by simply stopping yourself and others from littering, you can protect the habitats of many animals. Maybe try riding a bike to work instead of driving to reduce your carbon footprint and protect the future of the environment. You can also donate to organizations committed to conserving endangered species. 
For example, the National Wildlife Federation allows you to symbolically adopt an animal by donating. Advocate to your governmental leaders to increase funding of conservation efforts, pass legislation related to conservation, and to defend the acts already put into place. There is plenty you can do to help the animals that severely need our assistance, whether they be small or large, furry or scaly, gentle or ferocious. We cannot let these animals die out, for both ourselves and the future. It is frightening to consider a future where children will only ever know what a lion looks like from pictures and stories. If we can work together, united, quickly, and decisively, it isn't too late. The human race can work towards a better and more biodiverse future, but only if we act now.